Welcome to PACU Nursing Minutes. Today, we are gonna cover induction and maintenance phase of general anesthesia. Because this is what we do in PACU, we recover patients from general anesthesia. There are several modalities, three kinds. We have where you are awake, and so that is like when you get a local block. Best example of that is when you go to the dental office and they uh, inject you with some lidocaine to numb you up for a dental procedure. Then there are spinal and regional blocks. Um, a lot of people are very familiar with epidurals for C-sections. And then there's also other kinds of blocks, regional blocks, um, like a beer block where you just need to um, numb up of an extremity for a surgery. Um, so I will cover blocks and awake anesthesia in another episode, but today it's gonna to be mainly general anesthesia, but I do wanna just cover the basics. So the next kind of anesthesia is moderate to deep anesthesia. And um, a lot of people are familiar with conscious sedation. Uh, this is a, a modality that is administered by a nurse working under a physician who is present in the room. So that's really common for like in the cath lab or in the interventional radiology department. Those are for short procedures where you don't need to be deeply sedated but you do need to have conscious sedation where you can follow instructions, you maintain your airway, but you have some amnesia where you forget some things, you're very relaxed, um, and, uh, and you have pain relief. Uh, other kinds of moderate to deep sedation is called uh, MAC, which is monitored anesthesia care. So this has to be done by a physician, an anesthesiologist, because um, they are going to a certain threshold of deep sedation where you can lose your respiratory reflexes, you can lose hemodynamic stability, and also um, they also need to be able to convert into general anesthesia with a MAC, and that does happen a lot. Uh, and we see that in the PACU when those patients who needed a little bit more, or maybe they were very sensitive and what would have been a, a light sedation turned into a general anesthesia. So the definition of general anesthesia is a drug induced loss of consciousness. And we all want that when we go to surgery, nobody wants to remember um, getting you know worked on. So, there are five goals of general anesthesia. And so the very first one is sedation and removal of anxiety, anxiolysis. So usually that is begun in the pre-op phase when you meet your anesthesiologist and they usually have a said, and they will give a dose one to two milligrams in the pre-op phase to induce that beginning phase of anesthesia, which is that sedation anxiolysis um, with some IV versed. Then the second phase of anesthesia, unconsciousness, hypnosis. And so once you get into the OR room, the anesthesiologist will continue to give you more medicine, which will make you even sleepier and sleepier to where you lose consciousness. Um, and then they also are giving you um, medication for analgesia so that you have pain relief. So usually in that cocktail, there is a dose of an analgesic like fentanyl. Um, in their induction cocktail. And then um, muscle relaxation is another goal of the anesthesia. So once you are asleep, these anesthetics will relax all of your muscles so that the surgeon can, you know, get to the area that they need to work to without um, working against your muscle contraction. Um, this is crucial, especially if you're doing a, a joint replacement or any kind of back surgery. Anytime you feel pain, you're gonna have a flight or fight response and um, from the autonomic nervous system. And so we wanna completely suppress the autonomic nervous system by getting complete muscle relaxation and autonomic nervous system reflex and response suppressed. So the deeper you go, you lose all of your um, autonomic reflexes. And this is where we know that you are now induced and in a surgical state of anesthesia. There are four stages of general anesthesia. We talked about the sedation and the anxiolysis. Then there is the excitation and delirium. Um, this is phase two of anesthesia, physiological stage. So when you go to sleep, 
you begin with being relaxed and sedated, but your um, nervous system goes through an excitatory phase. And we really see this actually with the awakening when you come back up through the excitation and the delirium phase. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about emergence in my second part of general anesthesia. The next physiological stage of anesthesia is called surgical. So surgical is where we want to have the maintenance. Um, this is where all of the, um, the five goals of anesthesia are achieved. And this is where we wanna hold the patient at chemically with our inhalant drugs to maintain that surgical state of general anesthesia during the operation. Now it is the anesthesiologist's job, all they do is watch your airway, your hemodynamics and support you. Um, because what they have to watch out for is the overdose phase of general anesthesia. And that is where you can have um, overdosing, which would cause cardiac standstill, um, cerebral standstill. You know, this really came home to me when I was trauma ICU and we were doing birth suppression pentobarb comas. And now I think back and I realize we were like on the borderline of overdose when we were doing birth suppression on EEG waveforms to minimize traumatic brain injury in the cerebral metabolism. A barbiturate coma, um, which is, you know, like general anesthesia. So there are four phases to general anesthesia. You have your induction, you have your maintenance, you have your emergence, and then you have your recovery. So the induction phase, this begins when you are um, arriving in the OR, you've received a little bit of sedation from anesthesia just to help calm the nerves. And now you're on the OR table and they're um, giving you some medicine in your IV. Those medications can be more propofol, um, that is the IV milk of amnesia, a hypnotic, and it also caused loss of consciousness. Um, and then there is lidocaine, uh, ketamine, which is a disassociative. Um, and then there is succicoline and rocuronium. So your um, paralysis for the intubation. If you have uh, difficult intubating, you may need to provide that muscle relaxation um, with succicoline and then intubate. So what they will do is they'll have you inhale um, oxygen um, or sometimes they use gases to do the induction. Then um, they will hyper oxygenate your lungs and your brain. Once anesthesia sees that you've lost your blink reflex, then this is one of the cues that they know that uh, you are ready and you have passed that delirium emergence uh, excitatory phase and now you're in that you are in the surgical phase of anesthesia and you are ready to be intubated. So they will intubate at this time and secure your airway with an endotracheal tube and then place you on mechanical ventilation for the surgery. So for general anesthesia, the maintenance phase, um, this is done usually with inhalant gases and I'm just going to go over three gases. These are the most common gases that I see out there. And I know there's other gases, but these are the ones that are used the most commonly. So we're going to talk about sevoflurane, isoflurane, nitrous oxide, so which we see a lot with our pediatric patients. So sevoflurane, it was um, developed in 1995. Uh, it is the most common current uh, inhalant anesthetic, uh, and you can use it for induction. You can also, it's most commonly used for the maintenance phase of your surgical dose of anesthesia, but it does not cause a cardiac steal. So it's preferred with your uh, cardiac patients. Um, and then also has minimal airway irritation. So less incidence of coughing and laryngospasms. So that's always beneficial. And then also it has a minimal effect on your intracranial pressure. So if you have a traumatic brain injury um, that you need to do surgery on, your anesthesiologist will probably opt for sevoflurane for maintenance. And then 95% of it is metabolized through the respiratory tract. So they um, breathe it out 
and then 5% goes through the liver. So you want to make sure that your patient does not have significant liver impairment. If they do, then just be aware if it is utilized that it can um, linger uh, there and um, cause a prolongation of uh, recovery. And then again, with renal failure, some uh, metabolites can build up. And so you could see a prolongation with recovery. It has no analgesic properties. Um, anticipate that upon arrival, you're gonna be needing to give opioids for pain management. And usually anesthesia is really good. They have medication that they are giving upon reversal and upon arrival to pack you to maintain um, that uh, suppression of, a, of a, significant post-op surgical pain. So my next general anesthetic gas that I'm going to talk about is nitrous oxide. And this was developed in 1845. It is also referred to as laughing gas. A lot of people will recall it from when they've gone to the dental office and they had a little mask placed over their face and they breathed it in so that they could have a dental procedure done. Um, the biggest thing that you need to be aware of as a nurse, um, if you are assisting and administrating it with a physician, um, it needs to be blended with 100% oxygen to minimize um, diffusion hypoxia. Uh, the normal blending percentages um, can be anywhere from like a 40% all the way up to a 70% of uh, nitrous oxide mixed with 100% FiO2 blended mix. Um, you want to make sure that you do not um, discontinue the oxygen, the 100% oxygen too soon when you have weaned off the nitrous oxide because there is a potential for um, uh, the nitrous to diffuse back into the system and compete for binding at the, alve uh, the alveoli level. And um, so the patient could develop um, diffusion hypoxia even after you have stopped the nitrous oxide. So remember to just keep them the 100% face mask on when they are recovering so that they can fully ventilate out that residual nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is an expanding gas, so it is contraindicated with any procedures that involve the eye, the ear, um, laparoscopic procedures, and then also the thoracic cavity, because you could develop, you could have a ruptured eardrum due to air expansion. In the lungs, you could develop a tension pneumo, and then you can also develop some rare things like air emboli in lung cases. So you don't wanna use this uh, inhalant gas very for extended long surgical procedures. And it also, it does have some anesthetic properties, but it is not a good neuromuscular blockade gas. So um, it's not used for deep general anesthesia. Uh, you will find it used in pediatrics commonly, uh, and it does work really well. We usually have great success. It's really good for induction. So that pretty much sums up nitrous oxide. I hope that that sheds a little bit more light on the classic term of laughing gas. So isoflurane, I actually, to be honest, uh, the last facility that I worked at, they never ran isoflurane. They ran everybody on sevoflurane. But um, the facility that I worked at before my last employer, we did use isoflurane. So I know it is still used out there and I'm gonna cover it. Um, one thing to be aware of with isoflurane is it is more irritating to the respiratory tract. So you can have more laryngospasms um, and uh, it's it has a pungent smell to it. So it's not used for induction at all. Um, but it, and it can also potentiate neuromuscular blockade. So it could take longer for patients to um, be reversed or they may need a higher dose on their reversal, might have a higher incidence of rigors with isoflurane. So have your Demerol ready and your bear huggers warmed up and ready to rock and roll. There is a lower incidence of bradycardia and you actually may actually see a little higher incidence of tachycardia with isoflurane. And then 98% um, of it, again, is excreted by the lungs. So you're always going to be promoting ventilation as your patient wakes up so that they can breathe off those gases and, and come on around. Isoflurane has no analgesic properties. Um, you're gonna be ready with some opioids to give immediately post-op if anesthesia hasn't done that already. So that covers our induction and maintenance phases of general anesthesia. Stay tuned next week where I will cover uh, emergent phase and 
the recovery phase of general anesthesia. If you like what you hear today, if you feel like I've given you value added, please like and subscribe the channel. Here are my references. And as always, PACU Nursing Minutes is free of any legal liability. This is for entertainment and knowledge sharing. Thank you for tuning in to PACU Nursing Minutes.